Because tonight, in this very room, a murder will be committed. If you hear any extra noise in this video, it's because I'm filming even though I'm not alone. Hi, I'm Lady Genevieve. If you're not new to my channel, you already know I am a massive fan of Knives Out. Not only is it part of my current wall layout, but I also did a massive video essay project that was an absolute nightmare to upload because of Lionsgate's deranged copyright settings. I kid you not, it took me over 10 times of trying to upload that thing, and then it kept getting blocked. And ultimately, I had to chop my work into separate pieces to be uploaded as individual uploads in order to be able to share what I created, and then those videos flopped. All this to say, I have spent an incalculable amount of hours watching Knives Out and dissecting it. It was one of my favorite films of 2019, so it was only natural that its sequel, Glass Onion, was going to be one of my most anticipated films of 2022. Glass Onion has currently kicked off its one-week run in cinemas, after which it won't be available to the masses for another month. The film will have its wide release on Netflix on December 23rd. I strongly recommend that you watch the film in cinemas and that you watch it without hearing any Anything from anyone, including myself. It is so much more fun to go in knowing as little as possible when watching it for the first time. I was even trying to avoid watching the full trailer or watching it too many times because I wanted to experience the mystery as it was intended. Given the popularity of these whodunits, I know that there are some people who have already seen it or are going to see it during this one week run in cinemas, and I do want to talk about a fair few details of what I loved about the film, but for the sake of being fair, I'm going to timestamp the sections of this video so that we start off with no major spoilers, then we will have a mild or medium spoiler section, it will not be very long, and then we are going to be getting into spoilers. Again, I will reiterate one more time, watch this movie without spoilers. Even if you like hearing what I have to say about movies, please do not watch my spoiler discussion until after you have seen Glass Onion. <sighs> Mr. Braun, I've learned through bitter experience that a, an anonymous invitation is not to be trifled with. Who hired you? I do not know. A few inches later. Mr. Hugh Ransom Drysdale, you might tell us all why you hired me. Starting things off with the most barebone feedback of the film, one of the things I love about Glass Onion is the way that it looks. This encompasses the locations that were chosen for filming, the fact that they chose to film at actual locations instead of doing absolutely everything in front of a green or blue screen, the production design at the main location of the story, and the costumes for certain characters, including Benoit Blanc, Kate Hudson's character Birdie, and Janelle Monet's character. The clothes for me were so important and working with Jenny and collaborating with her and the team was also really wonderful because Jenny is a great collaborator and also a great, like, has great style and knew this character up and down. I feel like our first fitting, I had picked all the outfits that I was going to do for the film. Like, it took just like that one fitting and the majority of things that she showed me and when she listened to me on like what I felt like Andy would be wearing, she delivered on that and I didn't have much like... I didn't worry anymore. You know, also you feel more comfortable in your character when you know the clothing is gonna be right. A big part of the process, honestly, was coming up with her look and her, her style, her costume. And Jenny and I, Jenny's a costume designer, she did an amazing job and I said to her, I want it to, I want Peg to look like she almost could have been cool, except it's like just two degrees off. Everything is slightly off. Like, you know, she's got the bucket hat. That's really in right now. But then it's like, oh, with the sports bra that's like creating a uniboob, and then the shorts, and basketball shorts are really in right now, but these aren't actually shorts, these are trousers that she's cut the legs off. You know, something. everything is slightly off and slightly lazy. It was always going to be a tall order to live up to the iconic outfits of Jamie Lee Curtis and even the Chris Evans jumper that went so viral online, but it was nice to see that there were still some people delivering the looks I want to see in these whodunits. Jenny Egan designed the costumes. I worked with her a couple of times before on the last Knives Out and another movie I did years ago, and I, I, I've loved her since the moment I met her. She's a, she inspires you to kind of bring along ideas. I had a, a couple of um, strong images in my head, uh, one of Jack Tati and also um, To Catch a Thief, and 
I showed her some images and she was she picked those up and ran with them and then she just brought her own genius to it. This is his Mediterranean look. We wanted to change him up a little bit and push him a little bit more modern, but still keeping that old Hollywood glamour feel to him. Maybe a little Cary Grant, maybe a little, you know, there's also a little hat that he wears at times. So there's a little um, comedy in as well. You know, Ben has got that such wit and character about him. But, you know, we wanted to also make it lightweight and, you know, silk and linen so he could actually breathe in this really hot Greek Mediterranean heat. Writer-director Ryan Johnson kept multiple people on this film from Knives Out, including cinematographer Steve Yedlin, editor Bob Duxé, and composer Nathan Johnson. This is very much a case of do not fix what isn't broken. He's like the best director. Um, he's such a good leader, and, and I can... I mean, I feel like I could talk about this for, for half an hour. Um, he is very precise with what he wants, and he um, his notes are story-based, right? So it's not like, change that, I don't like it. It's like, no, at this point, here's what we need to be feeling. And as a composer, that it that means the world to, to not just have a random note, but to understand why he's giving that note from a story motivation, from a character motivation, all of that unlocks for me what I need to do to help him tell the story that he's trying to tell. Um, so he's he's kind of incredible in that he um, he'll give story notes but create a, a kind of an amazing sandbox to play in. All of these technical components of Knives Out were excellent, and clearly this is a team of people who work well together, and even though Glass Onion is its own story, I do appreciate that there is a similar aesthetic style that makes these films feel like they're from the same universe. One of the many things I loved about Knives Out was its socio-political commentary. Glass Onion also has a lot to say in that regard, the details of which are best kept to myself until we get to the spoilers section. I know that the cast is full of big name performers, but one of the characters I want to hype up since they are only in the film briefly is Duke's mother. Duke is Dave Bautista's character and the mother, she completely stole the show for the few minutes of screen time that she had. Freaking Miles, man. Genius. That first one's a Fibonacci sequence. Ma! It seems as though one of the recurring talking points that keeps popping up is about whether or not Glass Onion is as good as Knives Out or if it's better, if it's worse. I don't think that there is a simple answer to that question. For one, Knives Out had the element of surprise working in its favor because no one was really checking for whodunits to make a big comeback on the big screen, whereas Glass Onion is a highly anticipated sequel with a lot of high expectations placed upon it because of how much of a hit Knives Out was. There are plenty of things I like about both films. Glass Onion delivers plenty of drama in a really fun way, which is what you ultimately want to see in a follow-up to Knives Out. If I were to nitpick anything about Glass Onion in comparison to Knives Out, it would be that in Knives Out, every single character felt so distinct and memorable and entertaining in their own way, but Glass Onion had a couple of characters in its ensemble that just did not live up to those extremely high standards for character material. I don't think the specific people I have in mind popped on screen to the degree that absolutely every major player did in Knives Out, nor do I find those couple of people particularly memorable on their own. Having said that though, the drama of the mystery itself more than made up for that deficit, if you want to call it that. There was drama, intrigue, comedy, and it was one of the most fun viewing experiences I've had all year. And at the time of making this review, I've seen almost 100 films this year that are specifically 2022 releases. Regardless of that one nitpick, I still gave Glass Onion five stars on Letterboxd. I am completely ready to see the next Benoit Blanc who done it. I know that Ryan has said before that he's ready to keep making more of these murder mysteries until Daniel Craig decides to stop taking his calls. So if they are both ready to do the next one, consider me seated and ready to watch with my notepad and pen in hand to take notes on the various clues and suspects. And I hope your puzzle solving skills are wetted. So now let's shift somewhat to the medium spoiler section. This part won't have anything too major yet, but again, if you're still watching and you have not seen Glass Onion, I really would prefer that you leave at this point. I know that's antithetical to the whole YouTube 
thing of begging people to watch your videos and watch them in their entirety, but I feel even more strongly than I usually do that this is a film that you are not getting the full experience of unless you go in to watch it for the first time, knowing as little as possible about what exactly is going to happen. So hopefully, those of you who are sticking around for this and the full spoiler section have already seen it. I've already seen Glass Onion twice. I booked the first two showings at the cinema because I wanted to watch it once to experience the mystery as well as the reveals. But then I wanted to also watch it again with the knowledge of the who in the whodunit so that I would be able to look more closely for the clues that I didn't catch the first time. And much to my delight, there were a lot of them. One of the most delightful surprises about Glass Onion were the cameos. There were so many unexpected faces that I was nonetheless happy to see. One of the cameos that I didn't catch though was a voice cameo by Joseph Gordon-Levitt. I am already booked to see Glass Onion a third time so I'm going to be paying much closer attention for that specific detail on viewing number three. I don't know yet how many times I'm going to see it during this limited cinematic run, but it will probably be at least a couple more. During the beginning of the film, when some of the characters are getting introduced, I absolutely loved the editing choice to have them shown with moving panels on screen. It was giving me that vintage feel, kind of like what I so enjoy seeing play out in Guy Ritchie's The Man From U.N.C.L.E. It's one of my favorite editing styles that I really want more people to use. I know that it might not make sense to use for every genre, but for a whodunit, yeah, absolutely. The structural choice of how the story is told and the way that things are revealed was very interesting to me because when I watched it the first time, part of me was wondering, well, wait a minute, are you breaking the system of a good murder mystery? You need to give the audience enough clues to be able to reach conclusions on their own. But then when I watched the film for the second time and I saw how much had in fact already been revealed in the first part of the movie, I realized that this was a great way to go about playing with the structure of a whodunit. One random tidbit I'm also going to include in this section is that there was a point where I thought that one character might in fact be the killer simply because of how they expressed their emotions in response to something bad happening. But then they didn't even end up being the killer. So now I have a morbid curiosity about if they were in that moment trying to play into the concept of a red herring or if it was just an unconvincing take that the editor decided to use or if this was something that I just completely over-exaggerated in my head. There was, however, something big that I figured out about the way the film ended before it actually happened, but the reason why I was able to figure that out is because the entire story is set up in such a way that information is shared with the audience that naturally leads to the outcome that is set up. It's completely possible to figure a lot of things out before they are officially revealed, but it's just a matter of whether or not you are able to catch them when watching the story for the first time. And honestly, I cannot decide if my first or second viewing was more entertaining because trying to figure out the big reveals of the story and then finding all of the clues that had been laid out that I didn't catch the first time both of those things were terrific fun. I know my medium spoiler section is extremely short, but I wanted to further delay getting into spoilers long enough to tell people, once again, to leave my video and go watch Glass Onion before coming along with me into my spoilers. Any questions? Uh, wait, what are we with? This section is for all of the people who have already seen Glass Onion and want someone to geek out about the details with. You have been warned, repeatedly. I know, it's a bit overbearing, but I feel strongly about it, so let's talk about spoilers. I want to first circle back to some of the points I've shared in previous sections so you're not left wondering what exactly it was that I was hinting at. The ensemble of main characters, in my personal opinion, felt like they were clearly split into two groups. One group was really bold in the impression they made, similar to the entire ensemble of Knives Out, and then the other group just ended up feeling more like secondary wallflowers or characters that mostly existed for utilitarian purposes. The first group, we can call them the A-team, was Benoit Blanc, 
Andy, Miles, Birdie, and probably Duke as well, even though he didn't get as much screen time. The second group was Claire, Lionel, Peg, and Whiskey. Claire and Lionel in particular were shockingly disappointing characters. It felt like they were mostly there in the story because of how their jobs made sense to the larger machine of the story. I didn't feel like I got a distinct identity for either one of them. Peg had some funny reactions to characters like Andy and Birdie, but for the most part, she felt like she was just there to play the straight man to Birdie more zany energy. Think like Margaret Dumont to Groucho Marx, but far less funny. None other than Hyman Gottlieb, director of the New York Opera Company. Do you follow me? Yes. Well, stop following me. I'll have you arrested. And Whiskey, her role also felt more utilitarian, particularly for facilitating the sharing of certain information that you need to know to get to the ending. But even when she was describing herself to Andy, it felt more like exposition dumping than it did me getting to know her in a way that felt organic. Next, I want to elaborate some of the feelings that I had about the cameos. I gasped when I saw Angela Lansbury. That was one hell of a Zoom call. Stephen Sondheim, Natasha Lyonne, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, but Angela Lansbury in particular. She already had a sort of unofficial cameo in the first film when Marta comes home and her mother is watching the Spanish dubbed version of Murder, She Wrote. Buenas tardes, señora Fletcher. To have her get to appear in this film and be able to do so safely from what I would presume to be the comfort of her own home, knowing that she belongs in this space because of her legendary standing in the whodunit genre, it really warms my heart. Now, it may feel bittersweet to some to see both Angela and Steven have their cameos when they have sadly passed away, but all I felt in that moment seeing all of them, but her in particular, was joy. Also, Hugh Grant having a cameo Cameo as Benoit's husband or partner, I don't know what their marital status is. That was fabulous. I would not be surprised if it was filmed the way that it was because of scheduling and also because of COVID protocols. You never actually see them in the same room, but I do hope that we are able to see them interact more in a future film. Additionally, Yo-Yo Ma, of all the people I would have guessed that I would see in this film, Yo-Yo Ma would have never been on my list. I did not see that coming at all, but it was a welcome surprise, as was Ethan Hawke. I did not expect him to pop up like that, but part of me couldn't help but feel like, no, Ethan, don't cameo. Wouldn't that exclude you from the option of playing a main character in a future Ryan Johnson whodunit? Unless they Doctor Who that thing, where they disregard his prior appearance in the series and let him play a new character further down the line. I certainly wouldn't mind them making an exception. And that's what happened with Noah Segan already. He's friends with Ryan and he's always popping up in his films. So he was in Knives Out as Trooper Wagner and he was very funny in that. Enter Benoit Blanc. Benny, look, I, I hear what you're saying, but just... But he was also in Glass Onion as Daryl. Must be nice to have friends who will just let you come be silly in a movie that they're making and hang out at a luxury resort for a few months. But you know what? I'm not hating on that, because if I was a rich and successful writer-director, I would probably do the same thing for my friends. The Serena Williams cameo was also unexpectedly funny, and also, it was not a bad way to try to film her without putting her into close contact with other performers. One other detail about Serena Williams' cameo, she is shown to be reading a book, and the book that she is holding is Gravity's Rainbow, which was a talking point in Knives Out. I anticipate the terminus of Gravity's Rainbow. Gravity's Rainbow. We're a book club. I know that. <laughs> How stupid do you think I am? I haven't read it, though. Neither have I. Nobody has. But I like the title. I'm starting to think that Ryan Johnson seems particularly determined to get me to read this book, but let's just say there are other things higher up on my reading list right now. The person I suspected at one point solely because of how they expressed their emotions was Birdie, because of the way that she screamed when coming outside to find that Andy had been shot. I don't know, just something about it. It was a weird scream and I wasn't convinced. One other tidbit I would like to mention is that I geeked out seeing Kate Hudson and Catherine Hall on together again in a movie, considering that I grew up watching them be besties in How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days. Catherine and I, you know, we go way back to How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days. Uh, how are things between you sexually? Oh, 
Uh-oh. <laughs> Admittedly, it would have been nice to see them interacting more and having more banter specifically with each other in this film than they did, but I can't exactly fault Glass Onion for that since the story is what it is and I cannot expect Ryan Johnson to care about throwing in Easter eggs for fans of chick flicks from the early 2000s. You know, I'm hearing a lot of latent anger here, Benjamin. <gasps> Rageaholic. I'm not a rageaholic. I really had to embrace the fact that it was beige. All beige, all the time. A lot, I was, I had to, I looked, I, w I went in for the first fitting with Jenny and I was like, <gasps> okay. Cause I saw Kate's rack, saw Janelle's rack, and then I saw Claire's rack. And I was like, okay, it's gonna be a lot of cork wedges. Flats, not even a wedge. <laughs> I wish it was a wedge. And I was like, I get to work with you and I get to wear a beige shift. <laughs> you know what, it was comfortable. There's no one I laugh with more than Katherine Hahn. And it was like that on set. I mean, we'd sit in the green room and we would start to go and it was just like, we just laughed our asses off. So of course, every time she showed up on set with a new beige outfit, I just laughed. I don't, I mean, I'm sure, I know I can laugh. It's like, I'm not laughing at you, but I'm, but I am, but I am because that's what we wanted to, that's the, that's, that was the goal. <laughs> it's like, the, her outfits to me, the robe was actually my favorite because she's, that's what she's wearing is her cover up, you know, is the robe from the room. That to me was just, I loved that so much. That's so Catherine. The explosive ending, I figured that out a while before it actually happened because they had very clearly set that up by saying that clear was explosive because it was leaking hydrogen. The entire compound is run on it. And really by the time you get to the end and these insufferable bourgeoisie characters are not going to do what's right, well, there was really only one thing left for her to do. Burn it to the ground. Que mi riporta un poco del pasado. It didn't make it any less satisfying to watch though, but let's rewind it back and start at the beginning. I really want to emphasize how brilliant this film is at executing its concept. And by that, I don't just mean the fun drama and mystery of a whodunit, but more specifically, the name Glass Onion being a reference to things which are hidden in plain sight. Instead of me reiterating every little detail of things I found entertaining, I would prefer to spend the rest of the review going through a few of the examples of this concept that I found when watching and re-watching the film. First of all, right from the jump, them calling Miles a billionaire philanthropist, the name is an oxymoron, and the first film already had a clear eat the rich voice, so maybe more of us should have suspected right from the beginning that the ideology of this film would be in line with that. They also say at the very beginning of the film when Lionel is in his meeting that Miles is trying to put a volatile substance onto a flight. That information is at the very center of the who and the why of this whodunit, but when you're watching Glass Onion for the first time, it's very easy to miss that detail in the onslaught of getting to know yous of the many players in this ensemble. When the group arrives at the dock, Duke is shown to have a gun, and that is very much a thing where you do not show the audience a gun unless it's going to go off at some point. Duke also says, Duke don't dance with pineapple, which of course let me know that he was going to have an incident with pineapple at some point. Oh! Oh! Whoa! Little bit of a sidebar, but I more or less assumed already that Duke was going to die because I saw a promo clip playing online, it was probably on Twitter, let's be fair, that showed the names of the main performers. And when they got to the end, they did the whole with Kate Hudson and Dave Bautista. And really there would be no point in giving him an end credit unless he was going to have a limited amount of screen time compared to the larger ensemble. Woo! You know he did. When they talk about Miles' affinity for analog and using fax machines, they say Miles doesn't even have a phone. That read to me like a clue the first time I heard it, and of course it was. When Andy tells the group off and leaves them in a huff and Claire chases after her, when we cut back to her, she says something like, something's off, she's changed. 
that line hits way differently the second time because you know that she's saying it because she doesn't actually realize this, but she's not talking to Andy. She's talking to Andy's sister. Rewinding a little bit further back into the story, when the group first arrives to Miles' compound and Whiskey gets off of the boat and she's a little too familiar with Miles, it's easy to assume, oh, Miles is attracted to her or maybe you're able to already figure out that they're having an affair. But the thing that a lot of people don't notice is that he comments on her necklace. The necklace ends up being a clue, but not only that, the necklace is something that he gave to her. And they reveal that later on in the story. But if you don't take the time to hear that information and keep it in mind while you're experiencing the rest of the story, you're not even going to realize how important that line is. They draw attention back to that necklace because when Whiskey is talking to Andy, except it's not really Andy, she again talks about the necklace. She explains that Miles gave it to her and the fact that she's a Taurus. Now, I would not have been someone who could put together the timeline of, oh, she's a Taurus, so that means that, because I don't know what astrological sign refers to a particular period of the year. Jumping back ahead in the story, when Miles is explaining how this murder mystery game is going to go, Duke asks him, when you're dead, will we still be able to talk to you? He's asking that because he wants to keep nagging Miles about him trying to get a slot on Alpha News. When that first murder mystery goes wrong, at least for Miles, that whole scene was hilarious, by the way, of Benoit immediately figuring it out. Miles brings Benoit upstairs and he says that he hired Gillian Flynn to write the whole thing. That's one of those details that doesn't necessarily seem suspicious on a first watch, but once you rewatch the film, it falls into place with all of these other instances of him not being all that smart or capable of doing things himself and each of those instances is a clue my puzzle guy barely got the five done in time and he apprenticed with ricky J. that's suspicious i've got the pre-definite detective in the world at my murder mystery party that is so legit i don't think it miss what you think it miss when Benoit spots the napkin on Miles' wall, he says something like, the famous napkin, I know that story. Yeah, of course you know that story because you've been scheming since before you even got here. You can also see Benoit looking at Miles very seriously and suspiciously while he's standing behind him. And he's even got that coin or whatever it is in his hand and he's doing his pensive detective posturing that we are all familiar with because we watched the first film. Benoit was clearly showing that he was heavily suspicious of and investigating Miles specifically. He wasn't just expressing concern for Miles' well-being like he was claiming to do to his face. Mr. Braun, I've learned through bitter experience that a, an anonymous invitation is not to be trifled with. Yo, it's not funny. It's really not funny. <laughs> Editing me here, another thing I want to add is that when Birdie comes out to the pool and she is sitting with Peg and reminiscing about how Miles used to eat out of the palm of her hand, you can see her bag rustle behind her. And that is Helen throwing in the recording device. You can also see a flash of Helen's dress as she sits down beside her. While we're on the subject, the first time you see Janelle Monet, she is wearing a towel on her head, which is conveniently hiding her hair. It's a perfectly natural way to hide to the audience that you're not actually looking at the person that you think you are. There is a lingering shot on Miles' glass when we get back to the main room where everything is about to escalate in just a few minutes, meaning that that glass is important. When Andy gets into her fight with the group and Claire is talking about how they all stuck with Miles, Andy says, my life was taken away. And unbeknownst to all of us when watching it for the first time, she means that quite literally because she's not really Andy, because the real Andy is dead. And it is so wild to rewatch this movie and see all of these instances where they were saying or showing you exactly what was really going on, but we just didn't notice or realize the truth of the matter until we do our rewatch. When Duke tells Miles that his numbers are up and calls him over to show him what's on his phone, you can see the screen and you can see that he has the actual story pulled up. Admittedly, this is not a clue that will work for everyone, but I have a YouTube channel. I do know the interface of what the app looks like when you have it open, and that was not it. Then when Birdie comes over and asks to see those numbers, Duke tells her no. The most obvious one that I will confirm because I have seen Glass Onion more than once 
is Miles's glass. If you watch the film back, you can very clearly see Miles hand Duke his drink from his glass. The key to that working out, though, is the fact that you have all this editing of Birdie spinning in her dress, and it's so vibrant and colorful that it acts as the perfect misdirect. We just wanted to make it something really special, and Ryan really wanted the spin and this colorful, and it almost is like an illusion. It's almost like a visual effect in and of itself when she does her spin. So it was just amazing fabric that we found and you know, our, ta our cutter Erica, you know, beautifully cut all of this fabric to make it so when you see that spin, it's almost like the rainbow's going in circles. And you know, she's such an elegant person and Kate just really plays up that character and anything you put on her is extraordinarily glamorous. And you know, it's just really fun and you know, our beautiful. Truly, I could watch this film several more times and I know that it would be very informative to me about writing and directing and editing choices because there are so many moving parts to this working the way that it does. Hey, try to solve the murder mystery if you can. I don't want to toot my own horn, but it's pretty next level. When everyone starts looking for Miles' phone and they want to silence it, that situation proves especially shocking on a rewatch because you can see the phone in Miles' pocket. There are multiple shots from different angles where you can clearly see he has Duke's phone in his pocket. And they very clearly told you just not that long ago that Miles does not have a phone. All those characters are looking for this phone and it is visible on screen and yet the audience simply doesn't see it. Unbelievable. Whoa, whoa. Another thing that's sort of a clue is the repeated use of the word pancaked. Duke is the only person in this entire film to consistently use the word pancaked. And more specifically, he only uses that word when he is talking about that incident of Miles almost hitting him with his car when Duke was on his way to Andy's house and Miles was leaving Andy's house. That is wild to me that they keep telling us about that specific incident, but for the most part, we don't notice that for the first time. Additionally, when Helen and Benoit Blanc are going out to eat, Eat, and they are running through the list of possible suspects, motives, and opportunities. Benoit Blanc outright says that the reason why Miles is an unlikely suspect is because he's not a moron. The exclusion of him from the primary pool of suspects is predicated on him being not only clever, but a genius. If that prerequisite is lost, he would consequently be revealed as the killer, which is exactly what you as the viewer are supposed to put together because of all the other clues that he He's not as smart or as capable as he claims to be. I've got the pre-definite detective in the world at my murder mystery party. Before I close off this video, I want to talk just a bit about some of the commentary involving Miles as a character and the central conflict of the story. It is, yet again, an anti-capitalist, anti-racist film, but more specifically, it is an aggressive call-out of billionaires. Ryan, instead of sort of just doing the refried beans of a, of a period murder mystery, he He's, you know, he's set these things in the times we're living in, and you get to laugh at, you know, the uncle who can't remember what country the, 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 you know, Martha's from. Our family's from Ecuador. Your family is from Uruguay. Your Brazilian nurse. Or in this one, you'll see lots of uh, people that you'll recognize from our tech Illuminati, um, you know, uh, 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 culture. And I think, I, I just think that he's he's made us like a murder mystery for our times you know and I, th I think that makes it especially fun miles quite literally performs a hostile takeover within the friend group typically the term hostile takeover is used to talk about corporate business affairs but the ability to conduct oneself in this manner at all there is no reason to differentiate where you would do these things whether it's in the business setting of corporate startups or the intimacy of a friend group. They outright say in the film that he social networked Andy, which is of course a clear indictment of Mark Zuckerberg. All things considered, I'm surprised I didn't figure out sooner what Ryan was going to do because both of his whodunits are commentating on similar issues and they both have similar heroines and villains. Heroines who are immigrants or heroines who are not white. So they are marginalized by the status quo. 
villains who are greedy, entitled, selfish, and the embodiment of everything wrong with a capitalist fascist status quo. The difference in story structures meant that we did get to connect with Marta Cabrera more from earlier on in Knives Out since we get our first introduction to her at the very beginning of the film. But with Andy and her sister, we don't really get a proper introduction to her until the second act of the film. However, I think the very ending portion of Glass Onion was more fun for me to watch. How many of you would love to get inside a billionaire's estate and destroy their criminal livelihood? I'm gonna just scoot on over and let you whack him. Get him again. Get him for me. Ah. Now, I don't say any of this to claim that Knives Out wasn't good or that it's not satisfying to watch Marta Cabrera win. It absolutely is. But Andy's sister sought out justice for her. She was the one to track down Benoit Blanc. She was the one who searched her sister's email and her house. She gathered loads of information to help him. And despite feeling scared and unprepared to go undercover when Benoit proposed that idea, she went with it. Then when the napkin went up in flames, nice touch by the way of having Lionel accidentally plant the idea to burn it in Miles's brain to keep this characterization intact of Miles being someone that is not smart enough to come up with his own ideas, she went ahead and tore everything down with her bare hands. The revolution will not come from people who passively go along with the system as it already exists, and none of those characters are heroic except for her. They completely lacked the character or initiative and couldn't be moved to do even the smallest thing until she had already done 95% of the work herself. But how much credit do you think she would get for what she did? You don't need to answer, we already know. There is something extremely funny about the timing of this movie's release. It is coming out at the exact time that Elon Musk is burning Twitter to the ground because of his fragile ego and total ineptitude at doing anything except profiting off of stolen ideas and blood money. Sound familiar? No. Undo that. Undo. Damn it. Miles is, I think, a person who's very convinced that he's the center of not only his own story, but pretty much everyone else's story um, and the world's story. Um, to say that Miles uh, ha um, has conviction in his own importance would be uh, an understatement. <laughs> Miles was ready to risk blowing up the entire world because he's not even smart enough to understand that hydrogen gas is highly flammable. You do not need to be a scientific expert to know that. The Hindenburg disaster is very famous. It is not an obscure accident at all. But the messaging of that part of the story is, those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. I loved Glass Onion. I love that it sends a clear message that the only way to effectively bring about necessary change is to organize and to violently fight back against injustice. They showed that asking politely will not get you the results you're after. You have to be bold and daring. And yes, Glass Onion is getting added to my revolution playlist. Follow me on Letterboxd. The internet is all about illusions, girl. You know that. <gasps> I do know that. There is a lot more I could say, but I have screeners to watch and review for Lady Chatterley's Lover and Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio. So I'm going to just leave things here. If you've seen the film, share your thoughts in the comments and we can all talk about the many moving parts of what made Glass Onion so effective in its storytelling. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. It is Thanksgiving season, so... Make sure that you watch Adam's Family Values, which continues to be a top-tier Thanksgiving film. I've decided to scalp you and burn your village to the ground. See you in the next one. Bye. How to work out a mystery when you're writing. I mean, I think, well, the first thing is, uh, priority-wise, to remember that the mystery is not going to be what keeps an audience in their seats. And to remember first and foremost that you're making a movie and that it has to dramatically work before it intellectually works as a puzzle. I would, the phrase I've used before is it has to be not a crossword puzzle, it has to be a roller coaster. You have to remember that's what it has to be for the audience. So dramatically, that means you gotta have somebody the audience cares about, they gotta be in danger, you gotta want them to get out of it by the end, and the ending has to be emotionally satisfying and not just intellectually satisfying in terms of, aha, that person did it. Um, 
So that's first and foremost. And that's actually still the hard part is creating a good story that feels unique and feels exciting and emotionally feels satisfying at the end. Infinitely harder than figuring out a, a mystery and planting clues and kind of making that whole thing work. Um, it's still the toughest thing to just tell a story that, that is going to get audiences excited to watch the movie, hopefully even after they know the solution.